through Conversations Podcast welcomes 2020 with an epic dialogue with Professor John Verveke. Professor Verveke is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. He currently teaches courses in the psychology department on thinking and reasoning. He also teaches courses in the cognitive science program. Professor Verveke has published articles on relevant realization, general intelligence, mindfulness, flow, metaphor, and wisdom. He is first author of the book Zombies in Western Culture, a 21st century crisis which integrates psychology and cognitive science to address the meaning crisis in Western society. He is the author and presenter of the YouTube series Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. In this episode, we talked about many pressing issues we face as human beings and how all of these challenges derive from one source, a meaning crisis. Professor Verveke would enlighten you with wisdom and his perspective on what's happening in today's world from many angles, such as the creation of artificial intelligence, rationality, decision-making, the mindfulness revolution, biology, collective wisdom, a possible reboot of institutions, the benefits of dialogue, and how all of these ideas relate with cultivating meaning in one's life. This was one of the most engaging conversations I have been part of. Professor Verveke is a remarkable person, and he's inspiring many, including myself, to begin a path of self-discovery. If you're interested in more of Professor Verveke's ideas, we will add all of the links to his work in the highlights of this episode, including his YouTube series, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Now, with you, Professor John Verveke. So, Professor Verveke, it's great having you here in this podcast, in this Two Conversations Podcast Edition. Um, I wanted to ask you, how would you introduce yourself to people who don't know you? <laughs> oh, it's wonderful to be here, Alex. Thank you very much. Uh, how would I introduce myself? I guess I did do, I'd introduce myself first in terms of my professional credentials. I'm an associate professor, associate professor in the teaching stream at the University of Toronto in Toronto. Um, I'm appointed in two things. I'm 60% in cognitive psychology. Uh, where I uh, do work largely on things like rationality, insight, problem solving, uh, mindfulness, wisdom. And um, I also am 40% in the cognitive science program where I teach sort of the introduction on how to do cognitive science. I teach uh, also courses on uh, neuroscientific theories of consciousness. Um, and then I teach also uh, in an uh, this is called Overload in a program called Buddhism uh, um, a Psychology and Mental Health Program. I teach there a course on Buddhism and uh, Cognitive Science, um, which was uh, sort of a place where the Awakening for the Meaning Crisis series was uh, sort of engendered. Um, and then, um, in addition, I teach erect, um, extracurricular courses on uh, Tai Chi Chuan uh, meditation contemplation. Um, so, and then um, uh, your your listeners might be interested to note that um, I also have an online uh, video series called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, in which I try to put uh, a lot of that research into wisdom and meaning in life uh, and consciousness um, and intelligence and rationality, uh, and also the work I do in cognitive science on relevance realization and the, the, the nature, sort of the uh, the dynamical nature of cognition. I try to put that all in the service of trying to analyze and understand this this problem that I've called the meaning crisis and then talk about ways in which we might cultivate ecologies of practices that would help people um, address that issue uh, because unaddressed it, it, it's causing a tremendous amount of suffering and distress. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're going to get into the meaning crisis definitely. I, I will add the uh, the link in the bio for the your courses on YouTube also. Mm. And yeah, so there's a lot to unfold there. And I want to touch on pretty much all of the topics that you mentioned here right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, I have just so, so many questions for you. And first of all, okay. So you mentioned that you're a cognitive scientist. And what yes. would you think that, what are some things that cognitive scientists know that other people don't? Oh, well, that's a good question because uh, it's uh, one of the first lectures I do when I do my course 
uh, what's called COG 250, uh, Introduction to Cognitive Sciences, asked that question. I don't, 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 I don't quite do it in terms of what do we know, it's a, what do we do in, in terms of what are we trying to learn about. But I guess it's, it's pretty much the same question. So, yeah. I'll, I'll, um, so the, the basic idea uh, goes like this. I have a TEDx talk that, uh, on my YouTube channel that uh, goes into this at more length if people want to explore that. But yeah. just the gist of it is, is this idea. Um, we, the notion of mind is, of course, a really important notion to us. It really matters to our conception as who, who we are as an individual, who we are as a species, the, right, uh, of the human mind. The problem with that word mind is it's equivocal. It has many different meanings, even though we use the same term. So there are, di there are disciplines, and they each study the mind in some way, uh, but they study it at, you might call a different level of analysis, and they use different methods, different methodologies, and cover, uh, gather different kinds of evidence. So neuroscience studies the brain, and it looks at neurons and does fMRIs and stuff like that. Uh, artificial intelligence tries to make a mind by manipulating the technologies of information processing. Uh, psychology studies the mind uh, by studying behavior, it runs experiments, and gathers statistical data. Uh, linguistics studies language because language is the primary way in which we express and work out a lot of our cognition and it 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 it, it, it looks for you know tree structures and recursive rules and you know, right and that and then of course what we're doing right we're we're beyond language uh, we're also engaging in culture right so long before the internet networked computers together, culture was networking brains together so that we could make use of the, our greatest adaptation, which is the cultural ability to activate and coordinate distributed cognition, doing all this powerful processing in concert, uh, coordinated concert with other people. And then, so anthropology studies the mind at the cultural level that does, mm -hmm. eth you know, you do an ethnography through participant observation. So here's the idea is you've got all these people doing, it's like, it's like each one of these disciplines is its own, if you'll lose me, uh, you'll allow me a, an analogy, it's each one of these disciplines is like its own country using its own language. Yeah. <laughs> right? Um, so each one of them is studying the mind and using very different theoretical terms and very different methods getting very, very different empirical evidence. And that's all great. And nobody in cognitive science would say, stop doing that, okay? Mm -hmm. that's, but what, we went, what a cognitive scientist says my, like myself might say is, yeah, but the problem is, it's highly implausible that each of these levels is acting, right? Each, each one of these levels, the brain level, the information processing level, the behavioral level, it, that each, and so on, each one of these levels is acting independently of all the others. They are probably all causally interacting and causally constraining each other. So the brain level is affecting the information processing, which is affecting the behavior. The behavior is probably affecting the brain level, uh, the, the information processing, et cetera. So the idea is we need a discipline that studies the relationship between the levels as opposed to studying the content of each level. Mm. It tries to study how do these various levels causally affect and interact with, with each other. And so this is an especially tricky thing to do because what we have to do is when we, we need, that's why philosophy is actually a part of cognitive science uh, because we have to, we have to, we have to construct yeah. the, uh, uh, these bridging vocabularies, these ways of thinking that will allow the various, dis these various disciplines to impact on each other in an insightful and transformative manner. So we can tr start to capture the way in which those various levels of the mind, um, <laughs> interact causally with each other. So if we can bridge between the disciplines, we can track the way between the different levels of mind causally interact with each other. So that's what uh, cognitive scientist is trying to do. Uh, so you have to go to school for a very long time because you, <laughs> yeah, uh, you, need, yeah. you, need, you need training at least one, I would say two, of some of the home disciplines. Like yeah. I, I have extensive training in uh, philosophy and psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got, and then you get a, a, at least additional good undergraduate education in like linguistics and anthropology and, and things like yeah. that, because you have to learn all of this in order to try and do cognitive science. Yeah. And as you said, the cognitive science tries to build this bridge between what we understand from uh, many different points of view, what is the mind. And yes. As you mentioned, there are plenty of ways of explaining it, such as, you know, neuroscientifically, chemically, yes. philosophy. Yeah. 
philosophically. Philosophically. And here's where I get kind of confused, you know, because can we define the brain being the same as the mind? Is there a distinction? I, 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 yes, I wouldn't. Do, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't do that as a good cognitive scientist. Uh, okay, let's, let, let me give you, uh, there's many arguments. So this is not meant to be the complete argument. It's funny, I just gave, I gave a version of this argument on, on Monday in my class. So you're, you, should be in my, you should be my, uh, my undergraduate course in uh, my introduction to cognitive. Cognitive science, yeah. I would be I'm honored to do that. I'm thinking on going in as an exchange student to the University of Toronto next fall. So hopefully, we'll see you there. Uh, well, then, we'll, yeah, that would be wonderful. <laughs> uh, so let's go back to one issue. Okay. So let's let's say you want. Let, let, do you want to draw an identity relationship and say, well, is there like is there any real difference between talking about mind and talking about brain? Well, there might be, and here here's the reason why. Suppose you, the neuroscientist, starts talking to the machine learning person, the guy who's doing artificial intelligence. Mm. And you know what? The artificial intelligence person it, is not working with a brain, other than in a purely metaphorical sense. There is no neurons inside the machines, right? Mm. There might, there's sort of maybe vaguely analogous if they're doing neural networks, but that's, a, that's still not uh, going to uh, really touch on my point very deeply, right? They're, they're not working. Yeah. Right. And what? And, and it's it's highly likely that if we make artificial intelligence, the hardware it will be running on is nothing like the hardware of the human brain. And in fact, it will probably, in many important ways, be physically different than the human brain. Have physical capacities that the human brain uh, doesn't have. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that trying to say that the mind is identical to the hardware that it's running on is to make a mistake. Because if artificial intelligence is a real thing, then mm -hmm. intelligence is not identical to certain brain states. Now, let me give you an analogy. It's only meant as an analogy, although some people take it quite strongly, like I mean, within cognitive science. Yeah. You know, the mind is like the software, whereas the brain is like the hardware. And you can run the software on many different kinds of hardware. You can mm -hmm. run in the in software of intelligence on, on an electronic motherboard and you're running all this electrical currency and blah, blah, that, you know, in a sort of standard uh, computer, or you can run intelligence on this organic mush that happens to be inside my skull, right? That was put together over, you know, several generations of speciations through evolution. So very, very different hardware can potentially support very, very similar software. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm a cognitive scientist, I don't want to give undue priority to the neuroscientist who says, well, it's just the brain. Because I'm listening to the artificial intelligence person saying, no, 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 it's the information processing, not the brain. Mm -hmm. The information processing can be run in things other than brains. Look, look at my machines that I'm working on right now. And then I'm going to listen to, you know, uh, maybe uh, a philosopher who will say, well, you know, that's gonna, that probably generalizes in all kinds of ways we don't even yet understand because we don't know what, what completed artificial intelligence is going to look like. So yeah. when I'm talking about the mind, I'm not talking about the brain. Now, I'm not talking about something that's separable from the brain, right? It's, um, every instance of mind is going to be an instance of a physical thing. Anywhere that, any more than you can find software that's separable from hardware. Like, even though the software can run on many different hardwares, the software isn't, can't float, float free, right? Whenever you're pointing at software, you're pointing at something running in a physical system. So you're not talking about the mind as a separate thing or a separate kind of substance, but you're also not saying that you can just replace all talk of the mind with talk of the brain, because then you're just getting rid of all the other disciplines that are telling us so much about the nature of intelligence and cognition. You know, what I find really, really profound about what you said is that even though they're not the same thing, it, it, we're talking about software and hardware. Yeah. What amazes, what really amazes me and I find deeply profound is that the, the mind itself can transcend the hardware, can transcend the brain. And I think it is a great way to start um, talking about mindfulness and, mm -hmm. and before we start that or perhaps we, we i could ask you two questions because sure, sure. you also touched about artificial intelligence and i think the the 
civil discourse and the public discourse everywhere has regarded artificial intelligence as superior to human beings, right? So not not yet. There were nowhere near that place. Exactly. But, yeah. but it, the futuristic uh, scenario, the the best scenario is artificial intelligence will replace. So that's that's like the the goal that we're trying to achieve. Even though not not every one of us agrees, that's like that's the perception of what I what I'm seeing and the, and that. Mm -hmm. mm. And what what you're talking about strikes me as let's let's reverse that question. How are human beings superior to artificial intelligence? Well, I mean, they're superior to artificial intelligence in a lot of ways right now. Um, it's, it's a very tricky thing, and we're pretty bad at it, actually, given the history of predicting the future of science and what, what it's... Um, I suspect, uh, like many other people, although there's really deep, deep issues, so notice my language is being very cautious, I suspect we will have autonomous AI in about 40 or 50 years. So I can answer your question um, with respect to how things are now. And there are many significant ways in which human beings still greatly exceed um, artificial intelligence. In fact, uh, many people are now creating a new category called artificial general intelligence, mm -hmm. in which they're trying to make artificial intelligence that will and someday hopefully be comparable or perhaps, perhaps surpass human intelligence. But in what ways right now is human intelligence um, significantly superior? We have, uh, uh, we, we have a general intelligence that still exceeds any machine. Hmm. Um, now, there's been some recent success on this, uh, but gen what do I mean by that is you're a great problem solver in multiple domains. You can learn how to swim. You can learn right, uh, about ancient Greece. Uh, you could learn how to play tennis. You can learn how to carry on a conversation. Right? So in many different domains, you can come to a very high level of competence. Our artificial intelligence, and that's why people are pursuing artificial general intelligence, is, is, is in general much more si what's called siloed. Like you get a machine that's very good at this very limited domain, and in that limit, like, like uh, here, here's an example everybody knows. We have machines now that can be human beings in chess, even the best chess players. Now go too, right? Go, exactly. That's what I'm going yeah, to say. Yeah. But, right, and, and I'm going to qualify this in just a second, but broadly speaking, uh, you know, that's where the, that's those that's where those machines that's where their competent ends. If you try to get them to learn something outside of outside, until very recently outside of chess, mm -hmm. they couldn't do it. So although they had artificial intelligence, they didn't have artificial general intelligence the way yeah. you do. Okay. Now there's been some very recent, and you, you know, and so we have to be very cautious about it because there's lots of criticisms that, right. But there's been some very recent success where they've got some of these, the most advanced AI to be able to be able to play multiple games and learn how to play multiple different kinds of games. At the same now, time? Uh, yeah. So, so you don't get like, yeah, it doesn't. Uh, and that, that's, uh, it, that's a very powerful thing because it means that the, the learning algorithms that the machine is using are much more generalizable. It's starting to be not just, the, the algorithms you need how to play chess well, right? It, it's the learning algorithms that allow you to learn how to do different things well. Now, that's important. And so I'm not, I'm not I'm, what I'm gonna say next is not meant to be dismissive. That, that shows that we're starting to move mm -hmm. in the direction of artificial general intelligence. However, nevertheless, these games still have, are still in quite a limited domain. They're well-defined. They have clear feedback rules. Right, long-term planning, right, is 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 not uh, is not necessarily a, a key issue, and there's no way to think that that those set of machines, for example, will learn how to tell a joke or anything like that. So, right, it's still a long ways away. Uh, so, you still greatly exceed the machine in how you have artificial general intelligence, um, and that's very powerful. You also have a capacity for insight. Uh, for reformulating problems that you've misformulated, uh, and we're, we're, we're very far away from understanding how we could implement that in artificially intelligent machines. Um, really important, and this is something I do some of my work on, it's very dangerous, mm -hmm. so I'm not only pointing to a lack in these machines, I'm pointing to a danger in that lack, that we're working very hard to give these machines intelligence 
uh, without working very hard to give them rationality. See, intelligence is what you use to solve your problems, but rationality is what you use to address the self-deception that arises in your attempts to solve your problems. And those aren't the same thing. Human beings are beset by all kinds, and for very deep reasons, uh, biases and patterns of self-deceptive uh, cognition. And what's, what I've made an argument for, I can't re reproduce the whole argument for, but here's the, here's the gist of it. The very processes that make us so adaptively intelligent are the very same processes that drive us into self-deception. Mm. And what that means is as we, and what seems to be happening as we're moving towards artificial general intelligence is we're making this, these machines much more like us. A lot of the features, the cognition is highly recursive, highly self-modeling, uh, it's, it, it's highly self-organizing, there's multiple machines that work according to different principles in kind of an opponent fashion. There's also a talk on this um, if people are interested. The point I'm making is as we make these machines more adaptively intelligently, more adaptively intelligent like us, we are also making it much more likely that they are going to be as self-deceptive as we are. Yeah. And so, because the, the, the relationship between intelligence and rationality is a very weak one. Your measures of your general intelligence are only very weakly predictive of how rational you are. So simply making a machine highly intelligent is not sufficient to making it highly rational. So one way in which you really exceed these machines, and it's dangerous that we're not paying too much attention to this, not only do you have more general intelligence, not, do you have more, not only do you have more insightful processing, you're capable of much greater degrees of rationality than these machines. And that's, uh, that's, a, very, that's a very, very important thing. And the fact that we're not paying attention very much to those, we're paying very, a lot of attention to the first one, trying to make yeah. these machines generally intelligent, but we're not paying very much attention to how to make them more insightful and, and how to make them uh, rational. These are ways in which you greatly exceed them right now. And if we don't start paying attention to those ways, we, I think it's dangerous for the kinds of machines we're making. I, I definitely agree. And one of the things that could include these rationalities, the, the having the notion of morality, what it's good and what's bad, no? Yes, yes, yes. There is an example that comes into my mind. I, I, I don't remember exactly where I read it, but imagine if I ask an artificial intelligence machine, how would it prevent um, that you receive spam email? Mm. And for me, if you ask me or if I ask you, you would say, okay, so let's block the people who are sending you spam. Mm. And I read that artificial intelligence could say, no, wait, there's an even better way to solving this. You know what? Let's kill humanity. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah, there's versions of this. It's called the paperclip problem. You might design an artificial intelligence dedicated to making paperclips, and it keeps sort of improving its performance until it sort of consumes all of the world's resources. <laughs> so the, the, this is a deep issue. Um, it is, yeah. Uh, because right now... Um, and this has to do with some, uh, some what I would consider cutting edge work in cardio science. Right now, these machines, these machines are processing information in a way that's not actually relevant to their own existence. See, the difference, of, the difference between you and these machines, this is another crucial difference, actually. Hmm. You, you are, you are, in, you are um, to use Varela's term, and work done on this by Evan Thompson, you're an autopoetic thing. You are a self-organizing system that is constantly making itself. I mean, there's a sense, and I, I'm trying to play on the word here, like there are lots of things literally matter to you, right? You have to, you, you're constantly building yourself out of your food, for example, or, or, right, or you're at least building your mind out of the information uh, that you're getting. So you're constantly making yourself and you are self-organized uh, to seek out the conditions that will promote your existence. So like a tornado is self-organizing, but it's not, it doesn't seek out the things that will make it persist, mm -hmm. but living things do. Because of that, things are actually relevant to you. They, they literally matter to you. L listen to the language or you, they're literally important to you. You have to import them into you. Right. Right. So you, because of that, right. Because of that, you actually have needs for yourself, right? A computer doesn't have any needs for itself. These machines don't have any needs for themselves. They do things for us, 
but they're not, there is no deep way in which they are organized, the, right? They, they're not machines that are making themselves. They're not inherently developmental the way you and I are inherently developmental. And because of that, things, things because of that sort of, if you'll allow me, that ontological structure, because they're not autopoetic, nothing can actually be relevant or matter to them for their sake. Wow. Now, it only, I would argue, it's an argument, not everybody would agree with me, hmm. but I think a lot of people would, that morality requires beings that have real needs. Hmm. I, only, I only should care about you precisely because you are the kind of thing that has needs, that your existence matters to you and is valuable to you in a way in which my existence matters to me and is valuable to me. And only because of that do, can a moral relation exist between us. So I think if we don't have these machines being autopoetic, such that things being relevant to them and them needing to be like in this deep sense, relevant to other beings like that, um, plus the fact that they're not rational, means that they're not going to be moral agents. We can make them like puppets perform yeah. in a moral fashion, but they won't have, I would argue, they won't have a moral status because they won't have real needs. Wow. And maybe I'll go out on a limb here by asking you this, but I think it's, it's a good question to think about. And one of the things that makes us, you know, makes me uh, want to have something or I need things, as you say, and things matter to me, are the narratives in which I live by, you know, yes, and, sure. and the meaning that those give me, give me to me in my daily routine and my daily activities. So would it be possible, let, let, let's say that artificial intelligence uh, acknowledges or understands meta narratives understands fiction stories understands mm -hmm. i'm gonna say even um characters in in a novel and would you think that i don't know if it's possible that they can understand that but would you think that if they have these narratives and they have to like they have to defend something for just for the sake of the argument, would you think they, they would improve in this, in this area? Um, I would say, I think you're making a good point about the, the role of narrative in, uh, towards our sense of self. Um, I would then go back though and say, um, a sense of self and a sense of agency do not make sense unless the thing is an autopoetic thing. Uh, what I, I'm making sort of a strong argument here that I think artificial intelligence is ultimately dependent on artificial life. Mm -hmm. where the thing is not a machine in a standard sense, it's much more like an organism. I mean, I don't think this is in, in principle impossible for us, mm -hmm. uh, but, and I think people's attitude towards artificial intelligence would change if you could make a good case. Well, the thing is, it, the thing is also alive in some real sense. It's not just intelligent. It, I mean, it, it's a self-making, self-seeking, self-serving yeah. uh, kind of thing. Um, and I think if you don't have that, if, you, if, if you're not that kind of machine, if you're not a machine that is constantly making itself into a new kind of machine yeah. in this self-organizing autopoetic fashion, I don't think narrative matters to you because I don't think anything matters to you. Um, the reason why, think, turn it around the other way, the reason why ma narrative matters so much for you is precisely because you are a developmental autopoetic thing. Here's the thing that's interesting about you. You're not a static machine, the way that my computer is, for example. Mm -hmm. you, are constantly, you are constantly in a process of self-making, self-development, which means you have to somehow link who you are now to who you are when you were three years old. Mm -hmm. and who you are when you were 10 years old, because you, those are not going to be, you know, even cat, like you, you, you have properties now you did not have when you were a three year old, deep, important properties, right? <laughs> then you'll have properties when you're 70 that you don't have now. And yet somehow we need to link all of this. We, we, we create what's called a temporally extended sense of self. You only need a temporally extended sense of self if you're an inherently developmental thing. If you're basically static in terms of your causal capacities and what you are, what does it matter? 
your, your, your developmental history is irrelevant. Yeah. But if you're an inherently autopoetic thing, your identity is bound up with your developmental history. That's why you need narrative. That's why narrative matters so much to you. See, but if that's a good argument, and I think it is, there were reverse holds. If you're not an inherently developmental, living, right, autopoetic thing, narrative doesn't matter to you. Now, could we make machines that process narrative really well in a way that would matter to us? Of course. I think that's, uh, that's only a matter of time. We're, we're making good progress on that. Mm -hmm. But that's not the same thing as the machine making narratives for itself that matter to its sense of self for, because it, you know, it is the kind of being that it is. Yeah. Did that, did that make sense? A lot. And, and it's a lot to um, like think about after, after this conversation and, and research <laughs> more. But I, I really like the word autopoetic. That's, that's really, it's a really cool word. word. And then uh, who, who, who proposed that word exactly? Uh, Fra Francisco Varela. Uh, and uh, he was um, an important figure in what's known as uh, 4E cognitive science or third generation cognitive science, in which these kinds of notions of self-organization um, are central. And then he, uh, I think his most important, I don't want to be dismissive. I want to, I, I'm trying to set this, his, his protege person that developed his thought the best is uh, my friend and uh, colleague, uh, Evan Thompson, who has really taken these ideas and developed them, um, I think in a very profound way. Uh, Evan is, is very uh, important figure within uh, cognitive science. He should be more widely known uh, in the culture at large because of, uh, I think, the kind of work um, he's done. So I had to recommend the work of Evan Thompson. I want to, can I say one more thing about this, all of this? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, because all of this connects to uh, what you might call my central cognitive science work. Not mm -hmm. the work, not my central work. My central work is the work on the meaning crisis. That's, everything is in service of that. But my central work as a cognitive scientist is trying to understand this, this very ability uh, that we have and that any information processor needs, which is this ability to zero in on relevant information. Because notice we've been invoking it. Things matter to you. They're important. They're relevant to you. Yeah. And, and um, uh, Reed Montague even said one of the important differences between you and a computer is that you have to care about the information you're processing. Mm -hmm. A computer doesn't. And there, I would argue you have to care about it precisely because you're always taking care of yourself. I hope so. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, I, even in a biological level, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Now, but, can, but here's the central issue to me. I think this is the key thing, the, the central feature of intelligence. Because if you, if you pay attention to how we think about, not how you, we use these words in common sense, but as we, how we, if we would use these words in a technically precise and accurate way, the amount of information available to me right now is overwhelming. It's combinatorially explosive. The number of options, the number of different patterns, like the number of different actions I could coordinate, all my different actions together. I could say a word, move a, like all the, all the options for what I could do is combinatorially explosive. Mm -hmm. All the information in my long-term memory and all the possible combinations is combinatorially explosive, right? And then any action I do, all of its potential side effects is also combinatorially explosive. Now, here's what you can't do. Any finite system can't check all that information. You can't check it arbitrarily, mm -hmm. and you can't ignore it. You can't check it all. You can't check it arbitrarily, and you can't ignore the problem. So you, somehow, and this is what's amazing about you, and this is, what, this is the final, I think, deep point that we don't yet know what, how to give this to machines. Is you do that. Out of, all, of all, all that, you just zero in like that on relevant information, and you do it again and again and again, and then sometimes you get it wrong. And you zero in on the wrong information, and then you self-correct. That's what insight is. You know, when you have the, aha, I shouldn't have been thinking about it that way. I was considering the wrong things, relevant or important. So not only can you do this, zero in on relevant information, you have, in, you have the capacity for insight and to self-correct in a powerful way. And yeah. that, I think, is so crucial. But that is only possible, I would argue, for a system that is ultimately autopoetic. Wow. I keep thinking when you when you say like zero in into something, making a decision. I keep thinking about the mechanisms in, in which we make those decisions. And for example, 
Jordan Peterson talks about this. You have to aim at something. And I, I think it's perhaps a, the similar thing. You have to aim at something and then, and then make a decision. And I keep thinking about how impactful it is in one's life having a, having meaning in life having a yes, meaning yeah. yeah and and i think i want to i want to start getting into into meaning and what's happening in for example in my generation younger generations why are we lacking so much meaning i would like to yeah. get your take on that and first i i, I want to go into well the, the let's say like the the bigger scale you know the meaning and then the mechanisms in which we can regulate the way we create meaning such as mindfulness sure, and sure, sure. there is an episode in episode nine which is called inside in awakening for yeah. meaning crisis where where you yeah. do this you, you do this example you 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 ask your class yeah, to, to, to tap on it yeah yeah to tap it and and i i started doing it you know and i never thought that i could it's quite simple you know but you can focus, if people, uh, if listeners here want to do this, go check the episode nine on, on Awakening uh, of, from the Meaning Crisis. I, I will add the, the, the link in the bio. But the thing is that while I'm tapping on this bottle, you say that I can focus on the, the pen, I can focus on the bottle, and I can focus on my, on my hand and yeah. the way I'm touching it. So that's, the, the, I, I want to get into those those things a big scale meaning yep. and the and mechanism the, the mechanisms within attention itself is that yeah. is that fair enough for representation Definitely. <clears throat> well so let, let let's uh, let, let, let's talk about this um, so I mean I'm doing a lot of great work with Jinsun Kim and Talia Francidis and Philip Riswick on this so I want everybody to know that there's work I'm doing with them on that and then all the work I'm doing on, on, the, on the meaning crisis, there's just tons of work I'm doing uh, with Christopher Pietro and Leo Ferraro and Anderson Todd. Um, so um, I, just wanted, I just wanted to take a moment and say there's lots of people um, that are having a, a huge impact. Um, I'm doing work with John on Logan on the nature of interest. Um, so um, I'll, I'll be talking as if I'm just talking about my own work, but I want everybody to understand I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm trying my best now to share credit. And, and yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of people that are contributing and have contributed. I mean, some of this, the important work I did, I, I owe great, a great deal of uh, gratitude and appreciation to Tim Lillicrap and uh, Blake Richards. So I just wanted to take a moment to say that because that this is very important to me. So thank, thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, so let's go back to what I was talking about because it, this is sort of a way that I, that I can use this to go sort of zoom out and zoom in if you, mm -hmm. if you, okay. This is this notion of relevance realization yeah. because here's, here's, here's the thing I, I would argue. This is what I argue in this series that when we're talking about meaning, we're, we're not talk, we're not, we're using it metaphorically. We're not, we're saying something analogous to word, the way words have meaning. There's something about them that organizes information in a certain way that connects to us so that our cognition understands and connects us to the world so we can do things. And so if we, if we move beyond the metaphor, I would say that I think that ultimately what we're talking about when we're talking about meaning in the sense of, you know, um, what makes a life meaningful to us or, or what makes our behavior ultimately meaningful is, is exactly this feature of relevance realization. So, um, so when I hold up this object, right, you categorize it as a glass, right? You categorize it as a glass or that your object there, it's a bottle. Now, just doing that, think about all of what I just said had to happen. Out of, out of all the stuff you could be paying attention to, you're paying attention to this, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you know how many properties that actually possesses? It possesses an indefinite number of properties. And you're, you actually could come up with a lot of them if, if you wanted to right? Mm -hmm. But you only zero in on some of them, mm -hmm. right? The ones that make it a bottle. Um, it's actually, you know, not a particularly bad weapon for choking somebody out, <laughs> but you, you, you probably didn't think of that property right now. Yes. No. no. <laughs> okay. So out of all of the properties, right, that you could think about it, you've got this set that you zeroed in on as relevant. And they're the ones that are, are matter to you because they're the ones that make it graspable and useful to mm -hmm. you and so it takes on this particular 
meaning for you. And so it's meaningful to you insofar as your relevance realization machinery, and I keep using this metaphor, has yeah. fitted you to it. Like out of all of the information, out of all the possibilities, out of all of the interactions, out of all of your memories, you're doing this and it's meaningful to you as a glass. Do you see that? Yeah. Does that make sense? So and notice all, how all of that is happening, right? At a level that's below your introspective awareness. You're not aware of doing any of that. On the right? unconscious, no? Yes, exactly. So now let's think about it that way. So what is it, what is relevance realization doing? It's sort of fitting you to the world. And that sense of being in contact with reality, not in some um, purely spec spectator sense, but the sense of being in contact with reality such that you are well fitted to it. Uh -huh. I think insofar as that's happening with respect to your physical environment, your own body, your social environment, other people, I think that's the core of what we're talking about when we talk about trying to make our lives more meaningful. We are trying to figure out how to enhance the sense of connectedness, connectedness to ourself, connectedness to each other, connectedness to the world. But instead of just saying, I can say connectedness now, you know what I mean, but I don't, I don't just mean it in sort of a, an emotional feeling sense. Yeah. I mean it in this deeper sense I've just been talking about that your relevance realization machinery is so well, it is very well attuned so that you feel like things matter to you and that you matter to things in other people. And I would say that notion of fitting connectedness and mattering is what we're actually talking about when we're talking about meaning. And so what we're, I think really talking about is we're trying to talk about Right, making sure that we have that fittedness that creates that bi-directional mattering because that's actually foundational to our, all of our cognition. It's foundational to everything we're trying to do. So I tried to show you, no matter what you're doing, you're hitting the problem of zeroing in on relevant information. And yeah. so if you don't, so I don't, meaning isn't in this sense it's, it's not sort of a cognitive ornament. It's not sort of an aesthetic thing. It's not something that, you know, we have sort of a Hallmark card relationship to it. Oh, meaning, isn't that wonderful? No, no, no. Meaning is the, it's the, it's the stuff, if you'll allow me a metaphor, mm -hmm. that your cognitive agency is made out of. So if, you, if you're starting to get signals that your life is not meaningful, what you're getting is you're getting feedback information that that fittedness, that affords, you know, mattering to and things mattering to you and you mattering to others, you're getting information that that fittedness is breaking down in some really central way. And that is devastating to you as a biological organism, as a social organism, as a cultural organism. Yeah. Wow. And that's, it. as you mentioned, the, we, we, we could argue that meaning and creating meaning and having meaning in our lives, it, it's a biological phenomenon also, because yes. you, you could say that there are people who argue that only uh, we, we're the transport, physical persons, our bodies, our, you know, perception, everything, uh, what constitutes a human, we're the transport for our DNA, you know, so the generation, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. such as Richard Dawkins and, yeah, the selfish gene idea. That that idea is is pretty much um, uh, rejected by m most modern biology now, right? Yeah. Because, go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted. No, no, no. Uh, so, what I what what I was trying to get in is that it's pretty amazing. Let, let's for just a moment try to accept. Let's say that the, right now we are only we're constituted by only uh, our selfish genes. You know, passing information. Yeah. Okay. And in a biological sense, it is quite strong that meaning and having a narrative and having a purpose in life helps the, 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 uh, our biology and our evolution and our, uh, right. you know, you know what I'm saying? So I, I, I would, but what I would say is uh, I, I, I'm allowing you for, uh, sort of 
uh, for, for the sake of argument that Dawkins is right about this. My son's uh, a biologist, so he, he, won't, he wouldn't like me ultimately. I, and my colleague, um, Dennis Walsh here at UFT, wouldn't like me saying that, yeah, well, let's go with it. But just for the purposes of argument, go with it. I would say that the reason why uh, meaning does that is precisely the reason that I said mm -hmm. um, that, what the, that the meaning machinery is ultimately the machinery that makes you an agent that makes you the kind of thing that is capable of solving problems to achieve goals on a reliable and systematic basis. And I think that, that requires meaning making, sense making. So, so if I'm, I just wanted to ask if I'm getting it straight, it's, it's for you, it's the other way around. Meaning making favors our DNA propagation. Would that be I, I, yeah, 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 very much, very much so. I mean, so there's probably, I mean, I think there's been selective pressure uh, for us to become intelligent and, and ultimately rational agents. I, 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 I think that, I, I think you make a very good clear for, case for that. But as Matt Rosano argues, that very process of making us more intelligent, rational agents, and by rational, I don't mean um, like symbolic logic manipulator, the primary feature of rationality is their ability, like I said earlier, I would argue that. And so what Matt Rosano argues in his really excellent book, Supernatural Selection, is the very processes that are making us more intelligent and more rational and more culturally competent are processes that are also making us highly sensitive to very sophisticated abilities in meaning making that we ultimately start to experience as religious. So if you take a look at the Upper Paleolithic Transition, when we start to do things like that are really, you know, we make representational art, we have long distance projectile weapons, we have significant trade networks. Um, but that's the same time in which you seem to get very clear evidence for the emergence of religious behavior. So uh, our spirituality, I think, is a way in which we, are, we have become highly sensitive to, and there has been uh, selective pressure to make us sensitive to, very complex capacity for, and if you'll allow me this, playing with, in the sense of seriously playing with our, mean, our relevance realization machinery to really enhance its functionality. And I'm using play the way we play music <laughs> because music is an example of exactly what I'm talking about. Music doesn't do anything, but what it really does is it really plays with your relevance realization machinery and really gets you sensitive to its operation. And notice how much Having music in your life makes your life meaningful. Yeah. Nietzsche famously said, life would be a mistake without music. <laughs> well, and well, I, I'm, I'm trying to grasp everything that you're saying and it's, everything that you're saying is mind blowing. So I'm trying to... Sorry. sorry. No, <laughs> it's even better. <laughs> um, I'm, I, I want to get into um, trying to connect this and I, I don't know if I, I will be like, speaking it tangentially, but you talk in your book, um, Zombies in the Western Culture, you, you, you yeah. mentioned something quite profound. And by the way, everyone has to read this. It is, even though it is, um, how, how many pages long? It is quite uh, around 150, uh, 155. Uh, oh, no, it's less than that. I think it's like 120 pages or something like oh, that. Yeah. I'm reading digitally. So I think when yeah, I... Yeah. I I did yeah. the, 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 the font and, you know, it changes the yeah. page. So even though it's, you could say it's not the biggest book in the world, it's one of the most profound books because... Oh, thank you very much. I really mean it because I never thought that I would be watching Walking Dead and that would be a series where zombies actually, <laughs> you know, <laughs> mythological meaning. So that's, everyone yeah. should, should read it. And thank I want to, I want to, I want to, yeah. Talk about just one particular thing that you mentioned. You you, you talk about the grassy narrows and the yes, domicile. Yeah, yeah. And that, that was domicile, quite, yeah. Domicile, yeah, sorry. Yeah. It was quite amazing because as we're talking about meaning, not everything that makes us um, you know, purposeful in our lives is deep within us. It's not a, always from inner inner world to the out, outer world, you know, these these individuals who are living in the grassy narrows suffered quite amazing consequences. And mm -hmm. I would like you to explain further on it for for our listeners. So, sure, sure. 
Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, just again uh, to point out that that book was uh, co-written with Christopher Master Pietro and Philip Misovic. So there's Chris again, and um, I I would point your uh, viewers and your listeners to uh, Chris is starting to uh, release discussions with other people. So people should Great. take Chris. Chris is um, he's just lyrically astonishing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, it's just really important. Uh, so. The, the notion that we're talking about their domicile, um, it comes from, I, and I actually got to meet him, I, um, uh, Brian Walsh um, talked about this. Now, I, I don't want to ignore the fact, because we do talk about this in the book, that there's also issues around the, the, wa the water is, yeah, is poisoned there. Yeah. Um, but what's, so the, it, we're not talking about like, this is the only cause of mm -hmm. the distress in the community. I want that, that made really clear. Uh, Brian's point is, no, it's that the, the way the culture tries to respond to this crisis, uh, the, this health crisis, is really, really, it's really demonstrative because it was, it was bound up with a change in housing um, mm -hmm. and, and other things. So, so the, the point that what's going on with the notion of domicile is that there's a significant difference between having a house and having a home. Mm -hmm. uh, that a house is a place, right, that it's a physical thing. Um, uh, a, a, a home is a place, well, just to use our language, in which many things symbolically matter to you and you matter to many things. Mm -hmm. You're not just taking up space and avoiding the elements. Your story is there. Your identity is there. The things that symbolize who and what you are, what matters to you and how you matter to others. So something being a home really indicates those three things I've talked about. When you're at home, you feel well connected to yourself, well connected to the world, and well connected to other people in some fashion, the people that are in your home with you, right? And so when you destroy home, which sometimes it means you physically, you physically destroy the dwelling, or like what happened to the Grassy Narrows, you give people actually better physical dwellings, but you destroy the cultural practices by which that was made into a home for people, when you, that's domicile, destroying the home. When you destroy home, uh, when you destroy the people's capacity to feel at home, mm -hmm. let's put it that way. When people can no longer feel that they're at home, then they start to suffer, right? A meaning crisis. They start to suffer very, very deeply because that sense of connectedness to themselves, to the world, to each other is really frayed. You know this because you, there's things you can experience that give you a taste of what domicide is like. Mm -hmm. If you travel to a country that that's, has a different culture and you've never been there before, you'll experience culture shock. You won't feel at home there. You'll be able to perceive physical objects. You'll be able to perceive, perhaps even talk to other human beings, but you'll feel really like, ah, right, because you're not at home. Now, that eventually is set, settles because you can acculturate. But imagine, in fact, instead of that cultural shock settling away it got worse and worse and worse and worse Oof. or another one and this is how we punish people sometimes solitary confinement prisons yeah yeah and i put you have a dwelling you're in a building but you're not connected to yourself you're not connect because your, your your identity is being taken from you you're not connected to other people you're not connected to the world you loneliness all like and think about so take unending prison the sense of that psychologically, take culture shock that's not getting better with time, getting worse, and they'll put them together. That's domicide. And you can imagine how that just deteriorates people. Uh, it just their, their whole sense of self and agency just, is, just is, gets gnawed away at to the core um, such that, you know, uh, suicide, violence, mental illness, all kinds of things, of course, uh, will increase dramatically. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Now, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing I want to say. Uh, yeah. you, you can think of all of the meaning crisis in, in one way. You should think of it in multiple ways. But here's one way you can think of the whole series of the meaning crisis is trying to say the following. In the West, we are now suffering domicide. We are, but we're, we're, we're suffering a kind of deep, profound cultural shock and loneliness but within what's supposed to be our own home cultural, right? Yeah, and that's the meaning crisis. That's, that's crazy because 
what's what frightens me the most and makes me nervous is that the fact that you talked about the prison confinement and solitary confinement and it's scary because more and more people report that they have less and less people to connect with in yes. other words they're they're being more lonely they're in a physical world which yeah. there are plenty of people but no one in their lives yes. matters you know and that's yeah. that's scary so how would you think that this scenario could impact um younger generations such as myself that report yeah. this you know how how is this meaning crisis affecting younger generations and what are you seeing okay so i i think there's a lot um chris and i did a video on this what we call the symptomology of the meaning crisis and so you can so there's a whole bunch of things that seem if you right if you don't have this sort of notion of the meaning crisis they they're all they don't there's it's all sort of seems like chaos but if you have the notion of meaning crisis you can sort of give a good inference to the best explanation why like they you can just see how they all sort of belong together and we use the idea like symptoms the very different symptoms of the same disease that's why we call it the symptomology of the meaning crisis so the first thing of course that i think well, probably comes to some people's minds and i was alluding to it is that even though worldwide because poverty is going down uh suicide is going down um in many places um in the world especially affluent places your generation the suicide rate is going up wow that's child suicide rate has in the united states has doubled i think these are children committing suicide um in the in the last decade or so i believe um and what we're uh what we're seeing this is the work of tatiana schnell uh that there's two ways in which that happens. So the people are sort of sensing meaninglessness that can lead to clinical depression and clinical depression can of course be fatal cause suicide, but independent of causing clinical depression, a sense of meaninglessness can just directly lead uh, to suicide. Uh, so that's one important symptom uh, overlapping with that. So this is a continuum. These things overlap with each other um, overlapping with that. Of course, what seems to be a burgeoning mental health crisis, um anxiety rates um depression all of these things are uh significantly uh, increasing um and then overlapping with that uh is all of our addiction problems that yeah. keep increasing and i'm deeply influenced by the work of my friend and colleague uh brilliant brilliant uh, neuroscientist uh his memoirs of an addicted brain is i think one of the best things about addiction around and he, his basic argument is that the disease model we have of addiction is the wrong model the model that he has what he calls reciprocal narrowing a, a learning model is has to do exactly with that what addiction is is this sense of being well connected to yourself to the world and to others what's actually happening is you're losing that that's what's actually being lost in addiction um and so um I think it's, you can make a very plausible case that the meaning crisis exacerbates and expresses itself in addiction. You've got the loneliness thing. Uh, you know that there was a recent survey in the UK, not only about the tremendous loneliness, but it was something like, I'm so I won't get the exact numbers right because I'm relying on working memory here, mm -hmm. uh, and my own long-term memory, but it's something like 80% uh, of people reported that their lives are meaningless. Wow, uh, 80%? Something like that. Yeah, it was a very high number. It's a surprisingly high number. Um, so you've got loneliness. You've just got this pervasive sense, right, of meaninglessness. Uh, and so you've got a lot of what you might call background cynicism and nihilism, mm -hmm. right? People just walking around thinking this is all pointless. This is all meaningless, right? Um, y you've got... Um, I think related to that is a, a pervasive sense. We talked about this in the book. Um, I'm using this term. I'm not trying to be vulgar or offensive. I'm using this term in a technical sense that, the, that there's just more and more bullshit everywhere. Yeah. That, 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 right. That there's just more and more of, of that going on. So those are what you might call the negative symptoms. Um, there's a few more negative ones, or at least they're sort of hovering. There's what's called the virtual exodus. More and more people are preferring there's even a book called reality is broken about this they're preferring spending time in the virtual world the world of games exactly and that overlaps with addiction too precisely because look look, look alex just look at these games look at what they offer 
Look at what <laughs> look look at what they offer because what they offer and the fact that people only find this in the game and not in the world tells you the meaning crisis. Okay, what do you have in a, what do you have in a video game? You have a narrative, a story, yeah. Yeah, that you play a central role in. So you get this temporally extended self that, that we've been talking about. You have a you have a way in which you can right self transcend. You can overcome your 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 defects, right? You can <laughs> transcend yourself because you can level up. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right? And then and and then you have ways in which it there's a rule structure. Everything makes sense to you. So notice how all of these aspects are so prevalent in the video games and they're lacking they're tremendously lacking by comparison in these people's minds in the real world people don't have a sense that they're connected mm -hmm. right that they have a way of self-transcending and cultivating wisdom they don't have a sense of being sort of fundamentally understanding reality in a way that makes a deep sense to them so you've got the virtual exodus but you also have positive things, mm -hmm. right? There, I mean, there's more negative things, but I, I don't, I don't want to get. There's too much to cover at all. But there's positive things, like you've got the mindfulness revolution, right? Now, there's problems with that. I have criticisms of that, but the, the mindfulness resolution means that people are trying to address this lack of connectedness, mm -hmm. the way their lives are beset by self-deception, right? There, right? There is the rise of the increasing interest in ancient philosophies like yeah. Stoicism or Buddhism, uh, precisely because, think about this. If what I said was true, if, if the machinery that makes us intelligently adaptive is also the machinery that makes us beset with self-deception, every culture needs practices that help us to overcome that self-deception and help us deeply reconnect and deeply understand ourselves in the world. Every culture needs ways in which you can cultivate wisdom in which you can level up in reality, right? <laughs> That's why there's the, the interest in these wisdom traditions, Stoicism and Buddhism, because people are, there's a wisdom famine. We have tons of information and we have tons of science, and those are good things, by the way, I'm not saying, but we have a wisdom famine, and your generation specifically has a wisdom famine, because many of you have disconnected yourself from Religious traditions, for often legitimate reasons, I'm not criticizing that, but in disconnecting yourself from the religious traditions, you also disconnected yourself probably to your culture's, right? As you disconnected yourself, sorry, from the religious traditions, you disconnected yourself from your culture's wisdom traditions. Wow. Because they, they were always connected. Both. Yes. Yes. Very much. Think about the, 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 one of the etymological roots of the word religio means to bind, to connect. Wow, I didn't know that. So, right, so people turning to these things and then something, other things. There's all these, new, and I get to talk with people like Rafe Kelly and Mike Mayan and others, right, that there's all these new communities emerging where people are trying to put together as ecologies of practices to help them overcome self-deception, help them reconnect with their own bodies, reconnect with the environment, reconnect with each other in deep ways, deep developmental ways. So there's all of these communities of practices that are springing up and are doing, I think, some really important good work. There's all these new movements to try and cut through the discourse and really connect us. I think of the wonderful work that, you know, that Guy Senstock has done with inventing circling and other practices of, uh, of authentic relating and authentic discourse. Some mm -hmm. of the work, you know, that I'm doing with Peter Lindbergh on this and other people, it's just, right? And then, and then also you can see that there is a cultural sense that there is a something like a meaning crisis. You have platforms like Rebel Wisdom, mm -hmm. right? You have the amazing work being done by Jordan Hall and Jamie Wheel and Daniel Schmachtenberger. All those, I mean, there's differences there, but I think one of the things they share is this analysis that we're, you know, sense making and meaning making, right? Need to go through our, we're at some sort of pivotal point uh, in our culture. So I think that's, I think that's a deeply positive symptom. So what I'm showing you is the way you can make sense of all of that stuff, all of the negative and all the positive, is by saying what's happening is the culture is going through a deep kind of profound meaning crisis. We are starving for wisdom, we are starving for connection, and we don't understand where we should turn to alleviate that, and we don't know how to deal with it when it bites into our lives and we suffer 
anxiety or depression or addiction or loneliness. Wow. Mm, that's a lot to cover. Um, I'm thinking in, you know, just because you, you, your intervention right now was in this, in this chronological order. So with cynicism, changing cynicism, which you talk deeply in your book, yeah. um, my question would be, how can we, how can we not be cynics in an ever increasing bullshitter world? Ah, that's a great, that, I think that's a great question. Um, and let's, let's talk, well, let's be, be very clear how I'm using the term first, because then I can give a more precise answer. Um, yeah. So it's ultimately deeply inspired by uh, Harry Frankfurt's seminal essay on bullshit, in which he made a very clear distinction between lying and bullshitting. Yeah. The liar, the liar manipulates you because of the way you care about the truth. Um, right, tells you something to try to make you believe it's true because if you care about it as true, you will act in a certain way. The bullshitter doesn't care that gets you to be uh, indifferent as to whether or not it's true, right? Uh, that's not how they're trying to motivate you. And so one of the things I sort of drew out from that, I think it was implicit in his work and I tried to expl explicate it and develop it. Well, then how does the bullshitter manipulate you if he doesn't or she doesn't, he or she doesn't get you to believe that something's true? Well, they manipulate you, you by, and this goes back to what we were talking about, how relevance is so important to you. Mm -hmm. and, and then when, when in a perceptible manner, not just unconsciously, they're salient to you. They, they grasp your attention, right? They're salient to you in a powerful way. So what does, what does the bullshit artist do? Well, they make certain things catchy to you, salient. They catch your attention and arouse you. You don't even have to believe they're true. They just have to catch you and be salient. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's, that, that's what I'm going to lead to. Exactly. The, the, the thing is, right, when you, know, when you see an advertisement and it makes some product salient, you don't believe the advertiser. But you know what happens? For all of your cynicism, you buy the product because it was made salient. And then that goes into your memory. And then that influences your behavior wow. in, in powerful ways. And here's the thing. And, the, and this is, was the connection you were making. And I want to I pick up on that. You can't really lie to yourself. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make, I mean, we use that as a metaphor, but it doesn't, because you can't, well, I, I know it's not true, but, but right. So, but what you can, so self-deception isn't really a mechanism of lying to yourself. It's a mechanism in which you bullshit yourself. Because what I can do, see, my attention is something I can directly influence. And I can direct my attention and make something salient that wasn't salient a second before. And then when I make, if I keep making something salient, it's liable to catch my attention now, <laughs> right? And so what I can do is I can make something salient until it starts getting catchy for me and then it will start catching my attention and now my attention gets narrowed almost like the addict and i lose my options and i lose my freedom and i'm manipulating i'm being manipulated by that whole process wow. so bullshitting see the thing about that's the problem with bullshitting like the, the the not only is is it sort of undermining our ability to connect to each other as as you, as your culture as your culture gets more awash in bullshit, we individually become more and more prone to self deception. We become more and more beset with self deception because we're we're like we can bullshit ourselves more and more and more, and then this all reinforces each other. Now, if you agree with that analysis, that tells you that although this is an important issue, there's no it, it's not it's not some deep dark mystery that we should just say oh there's nothing we can do about it the way cynicism tends to do. Mm -hmm. It says, no, 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 there is a response to bullshit. There is a response to undermining connection and to being self-deceptive. It's to cultivate wisdom. And there are powerful, powerful ways. There are powerful things you can learn that will actually redirect how you direct your attention, redirect how you right, connect to other people, redirect and give you capacities for self-transcendence, enhance your capacity for insight, enhance your ability to get into the flow state, et cetera, et cetera. There are many things you can do that can ameliorate and address the lack of connection and the pervasiveness of bullshit. So if you're cynical, 
and, right? And the basis of your cynicism is says, well, it's pervasive and there's nothing we can do about it because that's just the way it is. Then you are speaking something that is ultimately false. Hmm. <laughs> is it pervasive? Yes. Is there nothing we can do about it? No, because we, if we understand it and if we know and if we have good science that says there are things that we can do that systematically and reliably address it, then we can do something about it. Wow. I'm, I'm trying to, let, let me ask you this. So right now you, you, you touched on, on, on wisdom and the, the biggest the boom has been individual wisdom, trying to acquire it through yeah, mindfulness, yeah. meditation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it, I, I could I could ask you this because our institutions has have made us uh, ever become more cynics, politicians, yes, yeah, yeah, religion. Yeah. So we've 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 lost faith in a definitely. deep sense. Yeah, and the thing is that even though I I I think that it it is very strong to try to cultivate wisdom with oneself with trying yeah. to meditate yeah, yeah. with my techniques or doing tai chi as you do <laughs> yeah 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 i think that as you say religion has existed for a long time these institutions have existed for a long time and would you think there is a formula to cultivate wisdom from within the institutions to ourselves Oh, uh, thank you. This is a gift question you're asking. Me. I mean, I, I, which is um, to say, I think it's an excellent question. I take it seriously, and it's it's at the it's at the forefront of my current work. Wow. And I and I think it, I think it picks up on um, things you're seeing. Like if if you go to the Rebel Wisdom channel, they're they're talking about collective intelligence now so much, mm -hmm. because and and this goes back to the point I made with you know about Matt Rosano's work, right? That our 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 most of our real problem solving is done with distributed cognition. It's not done by individuals. Like other than your naked body, everything else around you is yeah. been done, is done and continues to be done in concert through with other human beings who have skills and abilities that you don't have and vice versa, right? That's most of our real problem solving is done with distributed cognition, with collective intelligence. Now, here's the thing I think that's very, very pertinent to doing what you're pointing to. How do we get collective intelligence to address bullshitting, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if I can put the question that way. And yeah. here's the thing. Here's the thing. Thank you. Here's the thing I want to say. And this goes to work Chris, Master Pietro, and I are doing right now. And, the, and, and right, it's something we've, we've just written on. Um, work I'm doing with uh, Greg Henrique on this. Um, work Peter Lindbergh and I are doing all this work and you know the discussions I'm having with Chris and Guy Stenstock and Jordan Hall they're all on this that's what I mean how this is like the 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 the, the cutting edge of where what I'm trying to do so let me just speak by an analogy first and then I'll try and flesh it out a bit remember how I said your individual intelligence is only weakly predictive of your individual rationality remember mm -hmm. and, and and we've got you know, the work of Keith Stanovich and others giving us tremendous evidence for that. So what do, you need, what do you need to do as an individual? You need to use your intelligence, right, to become aware of how your, uh, how your problem solving can make you self-deceptive and then learn ways of intervening on that so you overcome self-deception, right? Mm -hmm. So just like we need to bootstrap in individual intelligence into rationality, we need to bootstrap collective intelligence into collective rationality. And then here's the next thing, right? You don't want to just be sort of rational in sort of one kind of knowing. You want to be rational in, you know, the propositional knowing, your skill knowing, your existential knowing. And I think when you're using your rationality to integrate all of your rationalities together, that's what, how you start to become wiser. And so we need to bootstrap collective intelligence into collective rationality and then collective rationality into collective wisdom. So how do we do that? Yes. Right? How do we do that? Well, I don't, I, I don't have a complete answer where, I mean, I think, you know, I think, you know, the people I've mentioned, uh, like Jordan Hall and, uh, and, and Daniel Schmeckenberger, uh, just a ton of other people, um, 
uh, Jamie Wheel and others, are, are, are everybody at Rebel Wisdom, I think, is really trying to wrestle with this question. So I'm not giving you an exhaustive answer, but I'm trying to give an example that's exemplary, if, if that's okay. So the work I'm doing with Chris and with Guy and with Jordan, especially with the stuff I've most recently written uh, with Chris, is this idea. There, so there was a practice in the ancient world that was designed to do that. It was designed to integrate the cultivation of individual wisdom with the cultivation of collective wisdom. Mm -hmm. And it was designed to help you simultaneously, you know, get those, those dimensions of connectedness, uh, you know, to reality and to yourself and to others, but also to afford you know, groups to collect, connect with each other. Um, and so that practice actually uh, emerges out of the Socratic tradition. It's all, to, it, it, it's, it's dialectic. Now the problem is when, when you hear that word, we just hear, Marxism or Hegel, and I'm not talking about Hegelian dialectic. I'm talking about Socratic dialectic. It's a very different thing. It's a practice in which you are trying to deeply integrate a connectedness with yourself and your own aspiration to rationality with connecting to each other so that you get into a collective flow state. And that collective flow state is also reflect reflectively working on itself paying attention to itself so that it is also pursuing collective rationality and the individual rationality and the collective rationality are resonating with each other and affording each other and you say that all sounds so abstract but it's not because if you go into like a circling practice one of these emerging practices that i you know i, I mentioned the work of guy senstock and others that's exactly what you do you sit and i i, I and I'm privileged to belong to a circling practice, you sit and you're talking, but you're not talking the way, you know, you, the way we talk a lot, right? What you're doing is you're trying to use lang, you're trying to make your language as non-bullshitty as possible, which is not the same thing as trying to make it like sort of scientifically yeah. accurate. You're trying to make it as non-bullshitty as possible. You're trying to be as deeply connected to yourself and you're trying to do things that connect you to other people in such a way. Now, if we could take that circling practice and put into it sort of aspects of argumentation in the philosophical sense and discussion so that it would go from just being a collective flow state of intelligence to starting to be co collective rationality such that we could look for the kinds of biases that affect the collective. So you, let, let me give you an analogy. You have it. I do too. We have individual biases called the confirmation bias because things are so relevant to us. We what I just did. I did. I did. I confirmed. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's right. So we, we tend to only look for information that confirms our beliefs, right? We only find that salient. That's a way in which we can self deceive. So if the see now, there's also ways in which a collective can get can break down, become self destructive. Uh, you know, like if, if there are ways in which people communicate that polarize a group as opposed to creating the, uh, as opposed to creating dialectic. So what, what are the things that polarize a group and how can we steer, right? How can we steer the circling? So as it pursues argumentation, it avoids polarization, right? There's, um, there's, I, 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 sorry, I'm not gonna go into great detail here, but what, do you see the analogy I'm trying to draw? There's things you have your individual intelligence with your individual biases, and there's things you have to do to ameliorate that. Then there's collective intelligence with collective biases, and we need to ameliorate that. And then what we need to do is a practice that integrates those two together so they're mutually affording each other. That's what ancient dialectic was in the Platonic tradition. I'm not saying we can bring that back because we're not living in ancient Athens. But what I'm saying is if we understand that practice very, very deeply, really, really get it, we can use that as a template for all these emerging practices like circling, like the anti-debate, like you know, insight dialogue, like empathy circling. There's all these practices. We could we'll use it as a template so that we could get these doing something like dialectic. And given the technology we now have, we have the capacity to make that a very, very powerful way to bootstrap collective intelligence into collective rationality, into collective wisdom, so that we have something that is a cultural counterbalance to the bullshitting and the institutional fatigue. Well, well 
I, I that's that sounds amazing, and hopefully we we continue to to work on that. Well, I'm going to. I'm, my next video series is going to be all about that. Oh, really? My next, yeah, my next video series is called After Socrates, The Pursuit of Wisdom Through Authentic, authentic Relating, Authentic Discourse, Authentic Dialogue. It's wow. going to be all about this. Just what I said, really understanding that ancient practice of dialectic, bringing it into dialogue with all these current practices, and try and see if we can point to a way of giving exactly what we were talking about. That's what the next video series is going to all be about. I can't wait to, to for you to start it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. Can, yeah, and w w okay, so this is a good way to, okay, I, I mentioned that you do Tai Chi and I, I saw that it goes outwards, inwards, you know. Yep, yep, yep. So yep. trying to do that in, in, in our dialogue right now, in our conversation, um, I'm trying to get into the specifics and then the macro and yeah, big zooming in and zooming out is really important. Yep. So when the Socratic method, what achieved was dialogue, right? It, it was meaningful dialogue, and it it what what I what I would say is that it didn't prevent uh, the uh, conversing about difficult topics. Actually, no, that was no, it. no, no, yeah, no, no. So how, how exactly. can we, how can we start? You know, talking about difficult topics such as ideologies, which I wanted to I wanted to ask you something about that. But yeah. let's set that for, for, for later. How can we talk about difficult topics without identifying with those topics ourselves and ah. prevent polarization? And so, that's, but that's exactly it. So the thing about the 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 if you take a look, for example, even the in the Platonic dialogues about Socrates, there I mean, it's not just argumentation. Uh, there, there's this deep recognition uh, that people don't just espouse their beliefs, they identify with them and that their identities are bound up with it. And so part of what you're doing, right, I, I think what we need, I, I, like it, just to propose a technique I don't think is sufficient. I think we need to see what you see in the, the Socratic dialectic and when I, when I see people starting to get sort of a, a deep sense of and a deep skill towards um, mm -hmm. in, 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 in these authentic uh, discourse and authentic relating practices, which is, no, no, you got, people, have to, uh, people have to train skills and virtues so that they come to have a deep uh, sense of religio, a deep sense of connectedness to these processes and, and, that, and their power and their capacity, their, their power to tr not only transform dialogue, but to transform identity. Mm -hmm. And then once people get a sense of that, because what we need, sorry, this sounds really, I don't want to come across as arrogant. I strongly believe, and I think I have good reasons to make this argument, right? to make this claim. What we need is to reestablish a deep belief in the process as opposed to our commitment to the positions. One of the things that, for example, is deeply degrading the political arena is people are no longer, we used to have a meta commitment to the process and that we understood that those people opposing me were actually valuable because we were in, not in an adversarial relationship, we were an opponent processing. We were in a system of self-correction. That's what, for example, the democracy was supposed to work that way. Mm -hmm. Right, and we were supposed to be committed to the process above and beyond our commitment to the position. But some, we, but we have lost faith, if you'll allow me that, in the process. We've lost. We no longer identify with the with the process. We identify with having and holding on a position and defending it at all costs against those other people who should no longer exist. It's not only that I don't need them. There's they're a threat to my position and my way. But if you can get back to, right, and I don't mean as an idea, you have to practice it. You have to feel it in the guts of your soul, you right? That, that, yes, you have to really, really get, wow, these processes, this the dialectic and circling and this mindful, like they are deeply, deeply like transformative. They deeply enhance my capacity for meaning in life. Then you will restore people's faith and commitment in the process. And that is what is, if people have that, then they can go into, they will reformulate dialogue and discussion and even debate 
such that it doesn't degenerate into polarized gridlock. Hmm. And one of the things that religion achieved was precisely that, no? The, uh, yeah. one of the, it was a vision in the long term, you know? It was trying to connect with, reconnect with God here. And maybe perhaps, if, if I can say this, one of the things that has increased our, our sense of meaningful, meaningless in our lives, in my younger generations, has, has to be related with the fact that we're becoming more and more atheists. We're, we're, we're yeah, well, that's not quite right. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to, to challenge you, but it's not quite, I mean, you're becoming more and more secular, which isn't secular. quite the same, same thing. Uh, because if you take a look at, so the, uh, what you're referring to is the, one of the largest, grow, one of the fastest growing and increasingly largest demographic groups are the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, people who have no religious commitment. It is, I, I'm sorry, I just, this is kind of a, a common mistake people make, and I, I just want to challenge it. I don't, I don't mean to be abrupt with you. I, no, I apologize for that. Don't but worry. It's, it's incorrect to think that the nuns, <laughs> this is a bad pun, sorry, but it's incorrect to think that the nuns are atheists. Um, what you see is they're, right, they don't belong to any established religion, but you see lot, you, there's a wide diversity in there. Very, only a very small percentage of them are sort of self-declared atheists. Oh. Many of them are spiritually exploring in some nebulous fashion, often, you know, what we might want to criticize as autodidactic and narcissistic, but, they're gen but there's generally much more going on than a, a simple, it, it, it's, 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 it's incorrect to relabel that group as atheists. I think what's happened is there has been the loss of, uh, of what you're saying. I think what we've lost is we've lost the commitment to uh, organized religion into a shared religious worldview. And in that sense, our culture is pluralistic and secular. Uh, and I think pluralism and secularism are good things too, by the way, because they've alleviated a lot of horrible uh, suffering. But nevertheless, uh, I, if you'll allow me to reformulate it that way, I think your generation is, is particularly beset by the fact that, yeah, they don't have a religious tradition that gives them a commitment to a higher order thing, that gives them a place where they can go to cultivate wisdom, that gives them practices where they can play with relevance realization and the machinery of meaning and feel deep sacredness. All of that hunger and all that functionality is not being properly met. So if you'll allow me, that's how I'd like to rephrase what you were yeah. saying. No, and, and adding to that, it's just the, the good distinction that, that you did, and thank you, is the, it meaning or, or well not 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 meaning spirituality doesn't have yeah. to be related directly with religion and that's, it doesn't that's, have to be that's uh, yes a, and that's quite a good thing because you know we saw how religion started to intertwine and grab the individual like and indoctrinate it you know? Yeah. Yes. There's, there's lots of reasons. Uh, and that's why I was very careful to say that there are, are lots of reasons that I would regard, uh, and the people of course, who have left organized religion, like myself, I would regard as legitimate reasons. Yeah. What I would want to say though, is, is, um, so first of all, I deep, I'm in deep agreement with you. You know, we don't want to reduce or identify spirituality, uh, with religiosity. Um, uh, I would say also that I'm in agreement with you that the, 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 I think of the main reason why many people make that distinction now is because they want to somehow salvage what we've been talking about here, this meaning-making, self-transcendence, wisdom cultivation, from a lot of things about the historical established religions that they find particularly um, unsavory or unwanted, um, sometimes I think for, I think for deeply uh, legitimate reasons. But all that being said, so deep agreement, there's a problem though. The problem that we're, we're, we're getting, and you can see this with the nuns, is what people think that means is, well, that must mean that I cultivate it completely individually. Exactly. And then, and then you get, okay, well, it, I, I get the religion of me that I cultivate for me, and then I get, I'm, almost, I'm completely autodidactic, and that I suffer all of the you know, tremendous magnification of my self-deception and my bias that being autodidactic does. And I get this fragmented, right, largely uncritical, idiosyncratic, you know, terrifically, you know, 
terrifically prone to self-deception uh, kind of spirituality. So that's the danger. So here's, here's the, one of the problems I want to try and address, uh, perhaps with uh, the help of dialectic. It's a problem that, um, you know, and I've been talking with Jordan Hall about this, and we have a video out on about this. We call it the, rel the religion of no religion. Uh, or the religion that's not a religion. I, I like the second one better, the religion that's not a religion. Um, and I want to make it clear, we're not trying to establish or found something here. We're trying to understand uh, a phenomena that we think is actually emerging. Because I think what we need is we need spirituality and collective wisdom together. Wow. And the, the thing is, can we do that such that we have a lot of what religion did a lot of the way in which religion enhanced religio without falling prey to the many reasons why many people reject yeah. established religions. That's the religion. That's not a religion project. And like I say, it's clear to us, Jordan Hall and I, that many group, many communities, many groups are pursuing this, right? Like, you know, I think everything that's happening on rebel wisdom right now is all about, you know, can we do that? Can we enhance spirituality, but in a way that's deeply enmeshed with collective intelligence um, without thereby nostalgically returning to the established religions that most people reject or without turning to the political ideologies yeah. right, that seem to be the only selected alternative that have drenched the world in blood? That's, what, that's the space that people are exploring right now. Yeah. And it's trying to get the best of both worlds, right? The, the, the new yeah, yeah. and trying to, to look back and, and, and ask, how did that work? And yes, yeah. what, what happened with that? So, yeah, we, we're covering a lot of ground here. And I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. And I'm having a lot of fun. And actually, I could argue that I'm in the flow state right now. <laughs> that, that's good. Now, I have to, do you mind if I just check the time here? Uh, yeah, that's what I was doing. I, I, I'm, I'm being, I'm becoming self-aware of the, of the time. For, yeah, I just want to check one thing. Um, that I can keep going. So I've just got an email saying that a potent, I, I had not gotten a confirmation about a, a, another interview. Mm -hmm. But they've now postponed, so I'm not under any. I, I mean, I can't go forever. I can't go super much longer. But I'm saying we don't have to cut it right now. Yeah, yeah, great, awesome. So, yeah, I, I want to get like my, my my perspective on what you're saying regarding the institutions, and perhaps you, you've heard about this before. And people who, who who are young like me, and I'm not saying that you're old. I'm not that you can take it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I just had my 58th birthday not that long ago, Happy so <laughs> yeah, thank you. So I'm not that young, uh, but well, that th 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 fair enough. Go ahead. <laughs> well, so as a 21-year-old, the, the, the typical thing for me to say would be that the institutions, you know, let's forget about them. Let's start creating Bitcoin, yeah. you know, and let's yeah, yeah. become yeah. uncentralized. And for me, that's quite... Uh, a shock because I never remembered in my lifetime, or perhaps when I become, you know, conscious about this issue, when we started to talk about politicians as corrupt people, when we started to talk about politicians as those who have the legitimate ability to just care about their own interests, I, I, that doesn't make sense for me. Politicians yeah, shouldn't, sure. shouldn't be in any way associated with those negative traits. And I, I don't understand why. So I just wanted to say that I keep having faith in these institutions. We have to reshape them because mm -hmm. truly, as I said before, right now, they're being associated with negative traits. Really? I agree. I agree. So I agree. What I'm ha having, I I'm, there's faith in this conversation and in rebel wisdom and the work that you're doing and your colleagues are doing that younger people like me who don't want to get into let's say, adopt an ideology, because that's, yes. that's a rather quick way to fix everything. But on a path of self-discovery and having the notion that even though I just mentioned the self, it's not only self, no. it's other people. So how can we, how can we 
as how can I differentiate between um, let's use the word bullshit ideologies or bullshit narratives and mm-hmm. meaningful and you know legitimate authentic narratives? Uh, I, I I mean I I I can give you sort of criteria by which you can distinguish them, but I want everybody to understand that I'm not proposing some simplistic tool ruler no. that because. What, what I mean, the deep answer is, well, you know what you need to do? You need to cultivate wisdom within a tradition or a community of collective wisdom that guides you in your individual contribution and that to, and, and your individual wisdom can contribute to the collective wisdom. And once you are in that place, then you can start to trust your ability to discern the real from the bullshit. That's yeah. the long answer. Yeah. Uh, it, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I think just I, I interrupt. That. Adding to that is the, the, the fact that, you, you know, um, I'm not trying to ask for prescriptions, you know, a formula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, because, great. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a distinction I want to make because I also believe that there is not such thing as, a, as you know, a path towards true wisdom. Everyone has their own. There are, there are certain, certain roads that have been created to do that. But yes, yes. you understand what I'm saying? So I'm not... I, I do. I, 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 you're saying that, I mean, even though there's a, a huge important collective aspect to this, yeah. there's no, nobody can do it for you. Right? Like, exactly. And it, the fact that uh, ideologies all often present a, you know, the, 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 the metaphysics and the morality have been worked out and here they are and now just do what they tell you to do. Uh, that's what you're challenging. And I think that's, it, that's important to challenge that. Yeah. Um, so I guess what I would say, though, then we're both, now that we've both sort of really put a good, you know, good set of constraints and caveats on what I'm about to say. So thank you for helping me with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I what I would say is, what is it trying to? What does it claim that it's going to give you? Because no matter what, when when like there, something's being sold, if you'll allow me that metaphor, what, there's something's on offer. Uh, even if it's, you know, some of it's often deceptive, they're, they're, something is promised and they're not, and we were aware of that. But often, I mean, they're true believers. They believe they're really offering you something, right? And, 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 and so what is it that they're offering you? And that goes back to the point that we just made. Are they actually affording you a path to individual and collective wisdom, to individual and collective religio? Or are they offering you a picture of the world and a set of rules, right? Because the first one, right, is designed to inspire you to aspire to a long process of a lived transformation. The second one is saying you don't need to go through individual or collective transformation to get the truth. Here it is for you. And for me, that is one of the, remember what we both said, we're, we're caveating this and constraining it, right? And so, but for me, that's a really good rule of thumb, mm-hmm. right? If they say to you, right, you need to, what I'm offering you is like a community, right? An, an ethical community. That's why Jamie Wheel's doing things on ethical cults as opposed to unethical ones and stuff like that. Um, but, right. What's being offered is a community and a path, right, for individual and collective wisdom. Because you actually, we cannot get to what's most real without going through tremendous amounts of transformation, Mm -hmm. both individually and collectively. If someone says, no, no, you don't have to transform. You're fine as you are. Here's the truth. And here's what you should do. That's the, how I distinguish between a wisdom tradition and an ideology. Wow. That's, that's great because what, what you're saying is ideologies or, you know, self-deception and self-deceptive ideologies are the quick fix. And that, that's quite the, the, the problem here. You know, there's, there isn't a fix. There's just, as you say, I, I like the word that you touch it. There's transformations. Yes, yes, it is yes. important to, to acknowledge that. So, yeah, Professor, I'm thinking that we should start wrapping up. So I, I, I agree. So thank you. 
Yeah, because we've covered a lot of ground and I mean, I have plenty of content that we could keep talking about and I hope we can, we can schedule another interview for another time if you're up to uh, it. I will commit to doing that right now, right here, right now. I've wow. really enjoyed this conversation. Wow. I think it's going, I think it's, you're, you're, you're handling the discussion. You're an excellent interlocutor. I like the way you're we're responding. I like the dialogue. I think it's wow. useful and fruitful, not only to me, but to potential listeners. Um, and so, uh, yes, we wow. will definitely do this again. That so, really means a lot. It really means a lot. Oh, well, 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 well it's, it's, uh, it's not flattery. It's, it's, okay. it's just, it's a genuine statement of what's the case, what, what is the case. And that's the basis for me saying, yeah, Let's do this again. I, I'd be happy. Um, I, I'd be happy to do it again. Definitely. Thank you so much. And yeah, so in, in conclusion, you, you, you've gone into a huge journey, or I would say a quest in, yeah. in creating the, the, you know, the awakening from the meaning crisis and, and all the opportunities that, and the doors that are open and those who have been closed, that have been closed. But my question here is, what is the most profound thing, if you can say one thing about the whole quest that you've been into, that you could describe for me in conclusion? The most profound thing? Yeah, the, the, the thing that, wow, that, as you've blown my mind right now, it keeps <laughs> blowing my mind always. Um, I don't know if I can put it as one thing. So give me a moment, please. That's a, that's a really, ref that's, a, that's a question that should only be answered after some considerable self-reflection, right? <laughs> if I were to just answer off the top of my head, it would be misleading. And you know what, that's also, that's great because not all questions need to be, you know, it, it, it is also important that, that, that you said, that, that you mentioned that because we have to take time to, to answer questions. Also. Yeah, very much. <laughs> I think the thing maybe that's so profound, the, the most profound thing for me is, and I've sort of touched on some of the words that will allow me maybe to say this, is the sacredness of meaning understood as the connectedness to oneself, to what's really real, and to other people. That's what's most profound for me sacredness of meaning i'm gonna write that down right now it's quite a quite a quote <laughs> professor this has been great and I, I wanted to let you know before before we finish all of the people who who you've been mentioned and all of the books i i will add them on the bo everything is going to be on yeah. paper good great as you mentioned it is very important all of the things that we talked about collective wisdom individual wisdom yeah it is important to give credit and thank you for pointing that out and yeah, this has been, wow. I can't describe it right now, but wow. I really enjoyed this very, very thoroughly, Alex. Thank you very much. And we'll keep in touch, okay? Take care. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. If you find this conversation insightful, consider subscribing to the podcast at any podcast feed you use and share it with a friend. We truly appreciate your support.